talking today about uh, some of my recent attempts to integrate bioacoustics, traditional forms of data collection, and machine learning, all for the goal of improving bird conservation and management. And uh, this is a talk mostly on some postdoc post work that I did with the California Academy of Sciences and the US Forest Service, as well as some key folks who work at Google who joined our team mid midway. I really could not have done this work uh, without any, any single one of these people pictured here. And I'll, I'll sort of flash up their pictures throughout the talk um, to designate when the content of the talk really, uh, really relied on their expertise as well. So just to give you uh, a, a bit of a trail map or an orientation for this talk, first I'm gonna take just a second to introduce who I am and, and how I got here uh, to these kinds of questions. And then I'm gonna introduce uh, the motivation for using uh, big acoustic data and ecological research. I'm gonna talk a little bit how we applied that to the context of the short-term responses of the, bird, of the bird community to to a prescribed fire in Central California. Um, first, um, without our acoustic data, um, so what we're able to learn from point count data or traditional data only, and then I'm going to show you how we integrated that remote sense data into our workflow. Um, for better inference. And um, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about um, some conclusions, recommendations, and um, a lot of ongoing work that we're still doing in this sphere, and then have some time for questions. Okay, so who am I <laughs> and how did I get here? Um, just a second, I'm gonna reorganize my windows. Okay. Um, I just wanted to provide some context for how I came to this particular subject because I think it illustrates the, the shared path that ecology and bioacoustics have taken. So my beginnings um, as a scientist were not in computer science or statistics, but in field biology. Uh, as illustrated by my struggles with this technology. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, but in field biology. So after uh, undergraduate, I spent several seasons working for graduate students, government agencies, and nonprofits, gaining skills like auditory bird ID and becoming familiar with the conservation challenges of the Western United States. Uh, I began my PhD at UC Davis in 2013 to study the impacts of invasive trout on high Sierra bird communities using acoustic recording units. Uh, so at this time, the state of the art was uh, the first model of song meter from wildlife acoustics. We only had 10 units that I had on borrow from the National Park Service uh, Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division. Really wonderful people who got me started. Um, and, and this picture is what our audio setup looked like. So I hiked 20 we hiked 20 miles into the backcountry with uh, basically a motorcycle battery and a metal solar panel along with um, the song meter to set these up. Um, at this time, machine learning methods to automate bird ID from acoustic recordings were really just a twinkle in the eye of a few software engineers. Um, and TensorFlow, which is a, a now a major open source machine learning platform, wouldn't even be released for another two years. And I didn't even know what a terabyte was. <laughs> um, so the results from that study are the subject of a number of different talks. But the long story short about the technology is that in the process, I piloted a number of different methods for making biological sense of the acoustic data. So from acoustic indices, which are mathematical abstractions of the complexity of a soundscape, um, to manually annotating every single uh, animal signal and 300 hours worth of recordings, it just became increasingly clear that the best actual scalable solution was one that employed machine learning. So I finally graduated <laughs> in 2021. This is me with my very patient advisor, Gail Patricelli. 
and uh, and then moved into this postdoc work uh, to try and tackle that that integration between machine learning and the ecology. So uh, in my graduate program at Davis, my uh, my fellow students and I often reflected back to each other that all of us are climate change scientists, whether we started out that way or not. And that's because uh, in this age, uh, we're faced with these unprecedented changes to the systems we study, whether it's ocean acidification, invasive species, pathogens like chytrid fungus moving into a study site halfway through your data collection, or a fire moving into your study site halfway through your data collection. We're sort of forced to reckon with these, with these unprecedented changes that are driven by climate change. Um, further, applied scientists like land managers are tasked with the restoration and management of these quickly changing landscapes. So whether our questions are about increasingly nuanced basic ecology or how environmental stressors can be managed at landscape scales, our rapidly increasing collections of big data have the potential to answer them if we are up to the challenge of interpreting them. So bioacoustics is one sort of leading edge of this revolution in incorporating um, sort of increasingly available remotely sensed data into ecological studies. So this is far from a robust meta-analysis of, um, of the literature on bioacoustics, but this is the results of a web of science search for articles containing the keywords bioacoustic or soundscape or ecoacoustics or acoustic monitoring. And you can see that um, really after 2010 was when there was a huge boom in interest and, and, uh, and research in this area. And then if you go ahead and add in machine learning, you can see that we are really, uh, really just on the, on the cutting edge of integrating uh, bioacoustics and machine learning. So the, the challenge here is that there's an urgent need to make these machine learning tools and data outputs available to land managers and scientists in a parsable, usable format. Uh, because typically, this work has been the purview of, of software engineers, not ecologists, where you know, this, is, this is changing. Um, but ecologists typically aren't trained in, uh, in you know, large language models and software engineering. Um, so one of the most, uh, one of the biggest challenges of, of my work in this space has been basically becoming bilingual for me an eco as an ecologist to learn how to speak machine learning and for my software engineer collaborators to learn how to speak bird. Um, and that has truly been the, the key to the success of this work. Um, so shout out to my software engineer and biostatistician collaborators at Google who are willing to become bilingual with me. So now in 2024, the technologies for um, collecting and analyzing acoustic data have really taken uh, a quantum leap. Um, and tools are becoming increasingly available uh, for, uh, for ecologists to uh, use machine learning models and then, and then uh, incorporate the output into their work. So um, the folks at Cornell, obviously, who created BirdNet, uh, which is now open source and anyone, anyone can use BirdNet um, without needing to know Python or another computing language. Um, the Kitsis Lab at the University of Pittsburgh has been um, hugely important in moving forward, open sourcing uh, machine learning tools, uh, as well as creating really, really helpful practical tutorials about how to go from, from the very beginning of even um, assembling an audio moth to setting it out in the field to uh, every environmental consideration you need to make all the way downstream to how to build a machine learning model, process the output, and then interpret it. So shout out to them as well. So the major questions of this talk will be, how do machine learning and traditional data differ in terms of their information content here? 
um, thinking not about one as, as better than the other one, but as both contributing sources of information um, to, to the problem. Secondly, what are the consequences of introducing false positives into the de data generating process? So this is really important because um, as probably most people understand about machine learning models is they can produce misclassifications or false positives. So how do we, how do we handle false positives um, when, we, when we incorporate them into occupancy models? And then finally, what conclusions about species relationships to habitat differ depending on what kinds of data are used? So uh, we ask these questions in the ecological context of forests in the Western United States and fire. So the growing scale and severity of wildfire in the Western United States has forced all of us, land managers, uh, all inhabitants to redefine our relationship with fire. Uh, the number of acres burned in wildfire in California alone has grown exponentially over the past decade. Uh, this is driven, of course, by a pretty extreme multi-year drought that happened in the early 2010s, um, as well as uh, increasing year-round temperatures. Uh, wildfires are burning much larger and hotter overall in the Western United States uh, and uh, threaten ecosystem services, threaten human health uh, and well-being, uh, threaten our ability to store carbon as forests are burning so hot they um, are unable to regenerate and turn into shrubland instead. So this is a very serious problem and, a, and an increasingly urgent problem that land managers in the United, uh, in the Western United States are facing. Uh, but fire is in fact an essential process in the Sierra Nevada, which is the mountain range uh, we studied in this, in this work. Um, and fire is an essential process in many other ecosystems as well. Uh, the biodiversity of the Sierra Nevada, in fact, depends on the pyro on pyrodiversity, which is the mosaic of burned areas across space and time. As the evolution of all the organisms that comprise that diversity has been shaped by a regular historic fire interval. Uh, so this is uh, fires that were started by, by lightning strikes, typically, or um, by intentional cultural burning by native Californians. Uh, in the case of this landscape, bands of the central Sierra Miwok uh, stewarded these lands, have stewarded these lands um, by uh, uh, burning for, uh, to promote the growth of cultural, um, culturally important and, and nutritionally important foods. Uh, but this was all prior to European colonization of the Western United States. And the reason why fires are behaving differently now and becoming a problem for ecosystem and human health alike is because in over the century following colonization, active fire suppression, the criminalization of native burning practices and large, tail, large scale timber harvests altered the structure of forests, uh, resulting in forests that are relatively denser, younger, so fewer old, old large trees, that are typically more resilient to fire um, and more homogenous in stand age due to, due to sort of clear cutting timber practices. Uh, they also, due to fire suppression, feature a large backlog of fuels. This has led to, wire, this has led to the wildfires burning hotter and larger on average than ever before. But because fire is in fact an essential and indigenous process to the Sierra, prescribed burning has been recommended as a way to reduce the risks of catastrophic fire by burning accumulated fuels in a controlled manner and to restore ecosystem health to the forests. Uh, these kinds of treatments are urgently needed given the, given the severity of the problem, but what, much of what we know about how fires affect wildlife is based on studies of wildlife after wildfire occurs. And, uh, 
And so much comparatively much less is known about how um, smaller, uh, smaller scale, uh, lower and mixed severity fire uh, impacts wildlife populations. And so if we're to if we're to uh, implement prescribed these kinds of prescribed fires as a potential land management solution, we need to understand how they impact the ecosystem as well as how they how effective they are at, um, at uh, handling accumulated fuels. So uh, this project, the goal of this study was to understand whether and how prescribed fire promotes resilience in Sierra forests. So the these state changes that I've described where forests burn so hot that they um, uh, cease to regenerate and um, shift into shrubland are evidence that Western forests are losing their resilience or their ability to recover their fundamental structure, function, and composition after a disturbance. And so we, uh, uh, resilience has been characterized as this sort of ball and cup diagram where um, a system with low resilience doesn't take much perturbation to slide over into a completely different state, whereas a system with high resilience um, takes quite a bit of perturbation to get pushed over into a different state. And so uh, our, our goal was to determine uh, to study a prescribed fire uh, before and afterward were to determine if we see evidence that it shifts for us to a, a more resilient state. Uh, our study site is the Cables Creek watershed, which is a mostly mixed Sierra conifer uh, forest that contains meadows and some, uh, uh, some a little bit of land above tree line near Carson Pass. Uh, Cables Creek is somewhat unique as a as a Sierra forest because the majority of the watershed is roadless. It didn't experience the pressure of timber extraction, so it has retained characteristics of a late cereal refugium or an old growth forest, um, including areas of 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 nice old closed canopy and many large old trees, which are important for lots of wildlife. Um, especially some wildlife of conservation concern like spotted owl. However, um, while it's an exemplar of an old growth refugium, it is also an exemplar of a classically fire suppressed forest. So it hasn't burned in over a, a hundred years, which has led to a ton of accumulated fuels, uh, making it vulnerable to uh, wildfire. So for this reason, the Forest Service identified it as a high priority area for restoration via a prescribed burn. The Caples fire was originally slated to burn in stages over the course of four years, starting in 2019. Uh, with a, and the first prescription did go in on what looked like um, a good weather window in late September. And so for days it burned at primarily low severity, which is exactly what we wanted to see, a sort of smolder, uh, some burning of fuels on the forest floor, um, and minimal tree mortality. However, um, winds picked up unexpectedly and the fire was eventually reclassified as a wildfire in early October. Um, <laughs> this uh, prescription, which was meant to go in in stages over four years, ended up happening all at once in a single year uh, because of this. And the fire ended up burning uh, in places at slightly higher severity, um, moderate and high severity than intended, than is and it is typically intended for, for a prescribed fire. Um, luckily, no one was injured. Uh, the firefighters uh, did an amazing job eventually containing the fire. Um, and from an ecologist's perspective, uh, it burned in a really beautiful mosaic of fire severities. Um, as you can see here, this is um, the Caples Creek watershed and um, unburned uh, areas are the darker green all the way up to uh, more severely burned areas where um, vegetation mortality is higher up in red. So we see this nice um, interspersed mosaic of burn severities throughout the watershed. Uh, 
Uh, so because we knew the prescribed fire was going in, we had the opportunity to co collect data before and after the fire to robustly track how the forest changed uh, with respect to both its structure and its inhabitants, especially the birds. So um, my uh, Forest Service and Cal Academy colleagues brought me into the study around this point after they had come up with this um, map of the study area, which we referred to as the game board, where we strategized exactly where we would go every morning and where the acoustic recorders would go every morning. And so uh, we collected data on the birds in two different ways. One source was the avian point count data. Uh, these data are collected by human observers. They consist of three 10 minute surveys per point uh, during the breeding period, during a, a fairly narrow window, window of the breeding period, which is um, about three. We were able to get these surveys done in between three and four weeks, typically around the month of June. And uh, the observer stands at one spot and records every single bird that they perceive uh, within a certain radius and then move on to the next point. Um, a key uh, a key characteristic of point count data is that accuracy is assumed to be perfect. So observers are assumed to, to correctly identify every single bird they write down, but um, observers can miss birds. So there, there are allowed to be false negatives. And if an, if an observer is unsure about the identity of a bird, it should be counted as an unknown an unknown bird or, or, or counted as a, as a false negative. So we assume that, uh, the, that this data doesn't contain any false positives. Uh, after about a year of this study, we had the opportunity to incorporate acoustic recording into the data collection process. Um, and our ARUs, our, our acoustic recording units, moved between points by the point counters about every three to five days. While we visited the sites, we sort of strategized uh, how to move the recorders such that every single point was surveyed by an ARU um, for a three to five day period during the breeding season. And we set the ARUs to record every 15 minutes on the half hour between sunrise and 10 a.m as well as starting again at 4 p.m. and through the night to capture uh, our nocturnal community. So these acoustic recorders are co-located in space, but not necessarily exactly in time uh, with the point count surveys. Uh, once we collected all of this acoustic data, you know, you have terabytes and terabytes, now I know what that is, um, of, of raw audio that needs to be processed through a machine learning algorithm. So Tom Denton is the creator of the algorithm that we use to process this data. And um, he has given entire talks on the, the architecture of his uh, machine learning model, which I recommend that you look for on the internet and watch. Um, but he has done an amazing job of creating a machine learning algorithm that um, works well with soundscape data, so noisy data where where the signals are overlapping one another, and there's wind noise or or other interfering noise. Um, and so the output of these of this machine learning model is um, for every two and a half seconds, two and a half seconds of the of the audio, uh, the machine learning model uh, assigns a score to every single species uh, that it has been trained to recognize. In this case, um, we limited the number of species to 79 potential species in the study area. And so for every single 2.5 second file, um, each species gets, uh, gets a sort of unitless score. We call it a logit, and I'll refer to it mostly as scores, but if I accidentally slip and say logit, that's what I mean which is uh, generally indicative of how, um, how well that the signal within that 2.5 second window uh, matches 
uh, the templates that the machine learning model has learned from, from other um, independent sources of these bird vocalizations. Um, and so for every 2.5 second clip, you have a score for every single species in the model. And you can, as you can imagine, that's a lot of data. And uh, how to incorporate those data into a model that also contains the point count data was, um, has been, continues to be uh, a huge challenge uh, and very difficult. So um, in the meantime, <laughs> while we were meeting to figure that out, uh, I analyzed the point count data by itself um, in a community occupancy model um, with my mentor, Angela White. And so uh, now I'm just gonna show you the results from this uh, multi-year, multi-species model with the point count data only. So no machine learning data in this model. Uh, what we found, I'm gonna skip over the modeling methods for that one. What we found is that mixed severity fire, such as the Capels fire, diversified the bird community. So what we see here is um, species richness. So the number of species that we detected per point um, for each uh, severity class of wildfire, or sorry, each severity class of the prescribed fire. And what we see is that on average, uh, species richness went up in every single in every single fire severity class. We also see that overall the entire uh, the entire the richness of the entire community of the entire study site shifted from a mean of about 18 individuals per point to closer to 21 individuals per point. Uh, at a species by species level, we were also, because it is a, a hierarchical model that includes all of the species, we are able to look at species specific responses to fire. And we found that more species increased their occupancy in burned areas after fire than decreased their occupancy in burned areas. And so this on the y-axis is a measure of uh, the probability of a bird occupying the burned area after after the fire. And what we see is that um, there's a whole suite of sort of fire associated species here, um, including blackback woodpecker, which we'd absolutely expect, western tanager, sooty grouse, um, and others. Uh, there were fewer birds that actually decreased their occupancy in burned areas after fire. And those included um, a couple of warblers, including uh, the yellow rumped warbler and the golden crown kinglet. Uh, another thing to note about this <laughs> is uh, the whole middle part of this graph. There are lots of species whose association we are actually really unsure about, and that is designated by these huge error bars. Uh, you know, there are some species that really do, we seem to have a lot of information about short error bars. This is warbling vireo. Uh, we seem to be pretty clear that um, it doesn't have um, a response either way, but um, for many of these species, we simply don't have the information to make uh, to make uh, an accurate uh, designation about their response to fire. So another thing that we investigated was of those fire averse species, these um, these ones that decrease their occupancy in burned areas. Only two of them actually significantly decreased their occupancy across the entire study area. And that was the golden crown kinglet and the Nashville warbler who, you know, it's hard to say, um, but maybe is actually already being counted in higher numbers two years after fire. And then another thing to note is that golden crown kinglet, although it did de decrease its occupancy across the Capels landscape after fire. It remained one of the most common members of the bird community, still occupying um, over 50 out of, of the 80 points that we studied. So um, 
we concluded that mixed severity fire has positive short-term effects on the bird community. Um, it's really important to note um, and interesting to note that these shifts in the avian community represent their initial response to the disturbance. And that as the forest regenerates and as successional processes occur, the avian community will shift to respond to um, ch those sort of concomitant changes in resources. But uh, what happens to the community in the first few years of fire sets the trajectory for what happens to that community in the longer term. And um, what we know about birds' responses to high severity wildfire in contrast, um, like the ones becoming more and more common across Western America, illustrates that really perfectly because most of the studies done on avian communities after high severity fires show a decrease in, in bird diversity. So we're um, concluding that uh, prescribed fire sets the bird community on um, a different and more diverse, potentially more diverse trajectory than one, um, than that of a wildfire. Okay, so by the time I had finished that analysis, oh, which is potentially uh, evidence um, that uh, that prescribed fire may may promote resilience of forests. So by the time I had finished that analysis, uh, we were starting to really make some progress with the machine learning data. And now I'll show you um, exactly how we incorporated it into into our model. So with these scores, um, we uh, were inspired by a few major breakthroughs that integrated acoustic data into modeling frameworks. And um, all of them draw some way or are rooted in a standard occupancy model or end mixture model framework um, that was put forth by uh, Mackenzie, Carey, Royal, Link, um, all those folks that, that gave us occupancy models, um, which are, uh, for those of you who don't, who, who aren't familiar with them, are a type of way to estimate an animal's uh, occupancy or abundance on a landscape while taking into account uh, that the probability of detecting that animal is less than one. So we might miss the animal even though it's there. And this was a huge contribution to, to wildlife ecology. And so all of us are standing on, um, on their shoulders while we make these um, while we make these uh, modifications to the occupancy model. Um, and this is also far from, far from an exhaustive list of every publication that is in, uh, that's attempted to do this, um, but we're, uh, I'm just highlighting the ones here that, that inspired our particular model. So um, the major question is how we handle data types with missed classifications or false positives, um, in our case from acoustic data. And so, um, uh, Mark Carey and Andy Royal described a possible model for this in their 2021 Applied Hierarchical Modeling book. Um, and that's been applied in a number of places, such as um, my colleague Jerry Cole wrote, wrote a really great paper that um, uses and modifies that model slightly. Um, and it, it does use directly the, the scores of that machine learning model that I described it uses those models, uh, those scores as inputs in the model directly rather than um, uh, picking only the highest one and and saying whether the bird is there or not there um, based on um, only the scores that you determine to be true, uh, true positives. Um, we also, there are also a set of models that uh, incorporate human validation into the process, uh, including Banner et al., uh, Reinhardt et al. uses a uh, um, uses only acoustic data in her model um, and validates a subset of it uh, and models uses both the ML scores and those validations to determine occupancy and um, her formulation of that really inspired the way that we handled 
the scores. Uh, but we also had our had our point count data that we really wanted to leverage. Um, so we looked to models that integrate multiple data sources. Um, Jeff Dozer and his colleagues in 2021 wrote a great paper uh, that integrates uh, point count data and ARU data, but which does not use machine learning scores as inputs. So whoopsies. We um, occupy this space here, right here. We want to use machine learning scores as inputs and all of the rich information contained therein. And we want to integrate multiple data sources. Um, and notably, um, we are not including human validation of the, of the machine learning outputs into this model. Uh, eventually, we would love to monitor, monitor communities and build community models. And I'll talk about that a little bit at the end of um, the end of this talk. All right, so for those of you who have no interest in the statistics, uh, the guts of the statistics, you can make yourself a cup of tea and I'll let you know um, when we're done here. But for those of you who are, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna sort of uh, reveal the skeleton of our model. So the goal of the model is to estimate the occupancy of a given species on the landscape. So that's denoted by Z. Um, so let Z of site I be the occupation status of a species at location, at a given location, um, uh, which can be zero or one. Z is drawn from, from a Bernoulli distribution with probability psi. And note that uh, we can add covariates on occupancy probability, like habitat associations, um, Using a using a logit link. So we use uh, three sources of data to jointly estimate uh, Z that that occupancy status. First, we use our point counts. These are represented by um, a presence uh, one or absence zero at location I on visit J. The probability of observing uh, a zero or a one is prescribed is described by p11 or the probability of detecting that species given its presence and note that um this is this is what a sort of uh detection history for point counts looks like when we give it to the model so um for example at 0 0.408 at all three visits this species was present um at 0.44, it was, visit, it was present on the first visit, absent on the second, and present again on the third. Um, and note that uh, we can also add covariates on detection probability. So um, the time of the morning, the, uh, um, uh, the experience of the observer, for instance, all sorts of things uh, you can include there. Next, we include um, a vector of scores from our machine learning model output from the ARU data. And specifically, they are um, the maximum score for that species of interest within a 15 minute file, regardless of whether it represents a true positive or a false positive. So for every 15 minute file, uh, we extract the very highest logit score, you know, from all those 2.5 second clips, we, we pick the very highest one for every 15 minute file. So these scores are indexed by site. Oops. And uh, they're described by two normal distributions, uh, similar to the ones if, if those of you who are familiar with Carrie and Royal's false, mo false positive model or Tessa Reinhardt's model, um, they're described by um, normal distributions um, one of which represents scores from occupied sites, and one of which uh, represents scores from, from unoccupied sites. So where Z equals zero. And ideally, a good classifier will result in a distribution of scores at occupied sites with a mean that is higher than those from unoccupied sites, because they will include a lot of high quality, high scoring um, uh, scores. Whereas all of the scores uh, that accumulate at uh, unoccupied sites are probably all 
or or should all be be quite low. Um, finally, we produced a, a binarized ARU detection history from those scores that looks very similar to uh, the point count detection history, except that every visit is um, a file. And the detections are determined by whether the maximum score for the species of interest exceeds an arbitrary threshold, uh, in this case, zero. So um, if, that, if, that if that file level maximum score exceeded zero, it will correspond to a one in this YARU visit matrix. And if that maximum score was negative two, that corresponds to a zero. Um, and one thing to note about this ARU model, uh, this detection part of the model is how it models uh, false positives. So we assume that um, false positives um, can occur uh, within a 15 minute file, regardless of occupancy status. So even sites that are occupied can have files that are unoccupied by, uh, by the bird. And uh, this is uh, a shout out to Lauren Harrell, my, my collaborator and co-conspirator in this design process. Uh, what I just described to you is really the culmination of of two years and counting of extreme engineering. So thank you to Lauren for, for being my partner in this. Okay, for those of you who tuned out, we did it. <laughs> we're, we got through the model structure and now we're gonna talk about uh, how we evaluated the model and, uh, and look at some results. So um, the first thing we did was we, uh, conducted a simulation study as a proof of concept of our model design. Um, and simulations are super powerful because you can uh, generate, you can simulate a data set um, whose parameters such as probability of occupancy you set so you know, and then you feed the data to your model. Um, and then we can evaluate how precisely and how accuracy, how accurately the model is able to estimate those parameters. So a poor simulation result suggests that the processes that generate the data like ours are described poorly by the model. So what we want to see is that the model is able to return us back the answer um, or the parameter that we, that we set. And um, talking about the simulation study could be an entire 45 minute talk on its own. And we are still in the process of experimenting with some different structures and more simulations. So all I'll say for now is that our preliminary results were promising enough to apply the model to real data, uh, which I'll show you. And um, keep a lookout for our paper on this in the coming months um, to get into the weeds of the simulations. Uh, so we chose uh, the Blackback Woodpecker as our first um, uh, test subject for our model. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, Sierra forest ecology, uh, woodpeckers are really the ecological engineers of these forests. They drill nest cavities into trees every year uh, where um, their last year's nest cavity becomes this year's home for dozens of other species um, from flying squirrels to pygmy owls to mountain chickadees. Um, blackback woodpeckers in particular are, are, are truly a poster child of, of specialization on fire, prefer, preferring severely burned forests shortly after a fire for foraging and nesting as they track um, uh, emergences in, uh, in beetles that, that, that come after fire. So um, back to one of our major questions. How do machine learning and traditional data differ in terms of information content? In order to answer this question, uh, we performed a knockout experiment where we took out different parts of the model um, uh, to see what happened to the, the uh, inference of the model. And our hypothesis was that removing any data type from the model will increase the variance of our parameters of interest and by parameters of interest, I mean um, the probability of occupancy 
that we estimate its relationship to a habitat covariate, et cetera. And so the way that we did that was we in turn knocked out all of the ARU data. So we only used point count data. We knocked out all the point count data and only used our ARU data. We knocked out just that scores component. We knocked out just that Y, uh, that um, ARU detection matrix component um, and, used, and used scores and point counts. And we compared the estimates. So what we see here, the, the um, striking feature of this, of this result is that the air, including the ARU data really increase models precision or its ability to, to confidently estimate a parameter of interest. So this parameter that we are showing here is the finite sample occupancy, which is basically the, the um, predicted proportion of sites occupied by that bird. And this uh, uh, sort of unsurprisingly is our point count only result. And including the ARU data of any kind shrinks those, shrinks those error bars. Um, it gives us way more precise estimates of occupancy. Um, also of interest is that this is the knockout that um, took out the scores and only used the Y ARU, the, the, the ARU detection matrix. And we can see that um, it really underestimates occupancy and also um, has higher variance than any model that contains the scores. So this one, uh, the first, third, and fifth in the model. And so this suggests that the scores contain so much information that maybe even including those threshold de detections might not be necessary. Um, as far as our second major question, what are the consequences of introducing false positives into the data generating process? Our hypothesis, or sorry, generating process, our hypothesis was that reducing the threshold and letting, uh, letting in more false positives um, into that um, ARU detection history should result in a higher estimated true positive and false positive detection probabilities. Um, raising the threshold, um, so being more stringent, should reduce both potentially to zero, which would make the ARU data uninformative if sufficiently few true positives um, actually made the cut. And um, what we found is that the false positive detection component of the model does work. Um, the more potential false positives we let into the data set by lowering the score threshold, the higher the model estimates that false positive rate to be. Uh, setting a stricter threshold reduces that false positive rate, uh, as you can see in the green bars in the middle here. Um, or sorry, uh, the orange bars, reduces the false positive rate uh, nearly down to zero, uh, but it also decreases the true positive uh, detection probability. And so the good news is that um, this purple um, is our estimate of occupancy, which stays stable no matter what threshold uh, you impose. Um, this is a map of where uh, different data types detected birds. Um, acoustic recorders did detect birds where point counters didn't, um, and in some cases, vice versa. Um, so these, these green dots represent uh, places where um, the, AR, the thresholded ARU data, so this could contain false positives, um, where the ARUs detected birds where point counts didn't. The yellow represent points where they both detected, uh, where both data types detected the bird, and these blue are um, where point counts only detected the bird, and then the purple ones are where neither detected them. And so the fact that ARUs uh, detected blackback woodpeckers uh, at more sites than, than point counters did is important because blackbacks are, are uh, notoriously shy woodpeckers, but they're also extremely territorial. So folks who study blackback woodpeckers in particular actually use an amendment to their passive point count study called a playback, where they broadcast the calls and drums 
of a blackback woodpecker using a speaker to attract any um, silent blackback woodpeckers to the area. And so this is the way that we have traditionally increased detection probability for these very secretive birds. But the downside is that those playbacks nearly double the survey time and is arguably a little bit invasive because we know that playback is known to elevate stress hormones in birds, et cetera. So the fact that we can increase detection probability by using the ARUs um, uh, really helps us study these, um, these uh, more difficult to detect species. So it seems to incorporate all of these data types together. Um, it tempers its estimates of occupancy using a combination of the site covariate. So in this case, we included a site covariate of burn severity, um, its estimation of false positives, and, and those distributions of scores at the unoccupied and occupied sites to, um, to estimate occupancy. And this, this graph, I should say, is a little bit circular in that it, it back predicts occupancy from the data using the same data um, for those particular sites. But um, me being the, the field biologist at heart, I had to go in and, <laughs> and listen to some of these um, ARU detections. And um, sure enough, some of them were true positives and some of them were false positives. And the model was able to sort of temper that. Um, well, they were, the model was able to detect um, that um, likely using a combination of that strong relationship to burn severity and um, and those distributions of scores. And so um, we also, because we added a covariate to the model, we can um, estimate habitat relationships using the model. We found that um, according to our expectations, blackback woodpeckers do severe, do uh, prefer severely burned forest, but they also use nearby green forests too. So contrasting with a point count only version of this model, which um, predicts much lower occupancy in unburned forest um, and much higher occupancy in, in highly burned forest, we see that that slope is a little less steep. And that's likely because we did have sites that burned uh, less severely or didn't burn at all that did have positive ARU detections of, of blackbacks. Um, and the reason why we saw that is probably because of the mosaic nature of the Capel's fire, that, that interspersion of lightly burned and unburned areas into areas of, of higher severity. And um, I'm sure many of the people who wrote the papers on blackbacks are, are in this very audience and, and know very well that um, survivorship um, and uh, uh, um, occupancy of of woodpeckers is actually higher in in high severity high severity areas that are close to unburned forest. So um, this confirms uh, what is already known about about blackbacks. Um, so we are able to retrieve reliable and ecologically sensible estimates of occupancy for a specialist bird whose association with fire is pretty legendary, the blackback woodpecker. Um, so we wanted to try our model on a species that's poorly represented by the point count data. Since one of the major motivations of including ARU data is that it can sample birds that, uh, that traditional surveys um, have a harder time sampling. So the common night hawk is a crepuscular bird um, with an inordinate fondness for beetles. It is a insectivore specialist and um, it's a species of conservation concern. And because um, it is such an insect specialist, uh, it's potentially um, an indicator of, of post-fire resilience because insect diversity relies on that patchy mixed severity fire. And so uh, just to throw back to that point count only model that I ran, um, prior to uh, our combined model. Um, this was our uh, predicted occupancy over a burn severity gradient for common night hawk. So as you can see, um, we have very, very low uh, precision on this estimate of its relationship with fire because it's uh, very poorly surveyed by 
the point count method. And what we find with the combined model, when we run this data on our, on our morning and evening data, uh, we resolve a, a very strong positive relationship to, vi to fire severity uh, with a common night hawk. So I'm gonna try and wrap it up pretty quickly here. Uh, we have a lot of ongoing work um, we're currently exper uh, experimenting with how the ARU data are aggregated. Should we aggregate um, those scores by file, by day, by multiple days? Um, we're working on adding covariates to the ARU data to account for um, uh, non-independence of those temporal estimates. And that's a whole um, realm of exploration of how to, how to handle that. Um, we're expanding into multi-year models, um, similar to the one that I showed you with the point count only data. And the really cool part of this is that it, uh, this model structure allows us to use varying amounts of point count and acoustic data. So for this site, like I said, we started out with a couple of years of, of only point count data. And then um, our first year of ARU recordings, we weren't able to sample all the sites because we only had eight or something. And then by the end of the study, every single point was covered by ARUs, and the model can handle um, these varying amounts. Um, so this model is potentially really applicable to people who have long-term point count data sets but are interested in starting to incorporate ARU uh, monitoring or transition into ARU monitoring. And then finally, uh, scaling up to a multi-species multi -species model. Um, is um is a pretty gargantuan task it's been tackled um really well by some other researchers a, a community model from cornell's group just came out this month which is um which is a must read for for this topic um and um it's likely not quite as simple as simply iterating these models over all the species in the community because um of correlations between false positives of one species and false negatives of another. So um, that misclass if there are chronic misclassifications of one species to another, um, that species will be, one species will be overcounted and one will be undercounted. And so um, exploring those, um, those sort of misclassification uh, connections is um, really important work to move that, move those community models forward. Um, Almost done. Um, our main conclusion is that these score distributions contain a ton of information about species presence. Um, and integrating those scores was one of the most challenging parts of designing the model, um, but it made a big difference in terms of um, the model's ability to estimate the, the relationships that we were interested in. So um, yeah, I think having, an entire distribution of those top scores for every single site visit, um, rather than just a zero or one, provides way more detailed information about whether that site is occupied. And it may even force us to think differently about what occupancy is, because with the ARUs, we'll detect roving birds that are that are moving out of its territory occasionally, or um, or floaters, or so. There are ways that um, a lot of hidden biology is embedded in the way that these scores are distributed across sites. And um, it's sort of endless exploration in terms of uh, what we can what can we what we can learn about them. Oops. Um, also, um, it's important to to know thy model. Um, model validation is a really worthwhile investment, even though it takes a lot of time. Um, uh, machine learning models can be prone to being confidently wrong as anyone who's played with chat GPT or any of those large language learning models knows. Um, and so as we start incorporating these increasingly complex data types into our models, we're still figuring out what our best practices are in terms of handling when the model is wrong. And so um, really exploring the, the machine learning model performance whether you're running it on a test set of recordings that you've annotated or um, you know, spot checking uh, um, 
machine learning IDs to, to, get, a, to get a precision estimate um, really helps us understand how these models are behaving. Um, and, and, and doing our due diligence reduces the risk of propagating a bad machine learning model into an occupancy model um, with, with, with bad consequences. So um, sort of akin to um, a machine learning image generator that gives people fin seven fingers on a hand. Um, we want to, to try and avoid that um, as much as we can. Um, however, uh, over the course of, of this project, we have really found that um, tolerating and appropriately handling um, false positives and misclassifications is, is totally worth the effort um, in terms of the, the amount of information that we are able to gain from letting them into the model. And so um, ongoing work on this project on the ecology side was handed to us by the Caldor fire, which burned in 2021. Um, so this is a, this is a, that fire severity uh, map for just the Capels fire out, um, outline, the Capels fire footprint. And then this is how the Caldor fire burned around it in 2021. And so you can see that in these areas of the Capels fire that burned, um, sometimes even at really low severity, um, the Caldor fire came in like gangbusters and then was pretty much halted around the fire footprint of the, of the Capels fire. And so um, the ongoing work for this study is to, to um, investigate whether prescribed fire scars actually slow wildfire at their borders and, and then looking at species responses after both fires um, to see whether they act as refugia for, for green for whether those prescribed fire scars um, act as refugia for green forests or fire averse species. So with that, um, I'm through and I'm happy to take questions. Nice, nice job, Mary. <laughs> um, so we have a couple of questions from the chat that I will uh, pa pass on to you. Um, Ray asked, how can this technology be used to include maps data? Oh, that is a great question. Um, where uh where maps data i mean i guess you could you you could use maps data and ARU data that aren't co-located but um thinking about places where people are banding birds and setting out ARUs at the same time um helps us um uh link our estimates of phenology so uh breeding phenology so when birds are arriving when birds are courting and laying eggs establishing territories, um, when fledglings arrive, when they leave, um, that amazingly fine-grained data that we get from machine uh, from MAPS data, we can link with ARU data and start to look at how um, vocal signatures of those uh, life history events map on to one another. And so um, there's a lot of opportunity um, to use those data types together to look at um, demography, phenology, uh, all, all sorts of things. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty exciting uh, link up. Cool. Um, Emily uh, was wondering what your thoughts are on a haiku box or a similar Terra CTT. Are you familiar with these acoustic monitoring devices? <clears throat> and do you have any thoughts on using them for research purposes? Um, mm. because they require power and Wi-Fi. Are they be or are they better suited for education and recreation? That's a good question. I my colleague Jerry would actually be a better person to answer this question. Um, not that you have to, Jerry. Um, but um I'm I'm a little bit familiar with haiku boxes, but I, I don't own one. Um so I can't speak to its uh performance. So I would I would I would say um, until people start doing um, pretty intensive uh, um, model validation on what whatever um, is inside Haiku Box, I would say they're amazing tools for 
um, for education, like you say. Um, great. Uh, Tara was wondering, did you face any struggles when comparing person conducted point count surveys to ARUs um, for species that have difficult to differentiate calls or songs? Yeah, that's definitely an area of active research. So you can think about, um, you know, fox bears and green-tailed towhees, uh, brown creeper and, and golden crown kinglet in some cases, these sort of confusion species and investigating um, the extent to which uh, the model also gets confused by these species. Um, we were concerned about this. And so uh, while we were in the field, we ran a subset of the model on some of these confusion, confusion species um, on recordings that we had recorded in the field. So we knew, we knew exactly um, who they were coming from. And we found that the model does a remarkably good job at some of the confusion species that we um, that we uh, tested the model on um, to the point where we ended up practicing for our point counts ahead of time by listening by listening to those um, ground truth um, outputs. But I should I mean the caveat is that you know we tested a few and. Um, I don't think I would, I would definitely not go ahead and say like, yeah, run a machine learning model on it and, and, and don't check any of the outputs because it's probably right. Uh, I would definitely caution against, um, that. Yeah, I should, the other, the final thing I would say about that is that even within a single machine learning model. So this is the, the model that we use is, is perch, which is also available, um, to use. Um, it's open source now. Um, uh, even with, uh, you know, BirdNet is another example of a model. Um, within a model, the performance varies between species. It varies between um, uh, recording devices. And so, um, you know, getting some precision estimates from somebody else whose recording, you know, settings you didn't even know um, doesn't tell you all that much about um, how it's likely to perform in your case. So the other caveat is um, is that, um, yeah, I guess it just gets back to know thy model and explore explore thy output. <laughs> okay. Um, Anna was wondering, do you have any sense from the data from the data set of how the machine learning model does with, calls versus songs, especially the chip calls of warblers? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, at this point, I've investigated more bird net output than output from, from this model in that particular case. Um, and I will say that um, It depends. <laughs> it's definitely better at, uh, it, or it's it's clear to me that um, high confidence tags of the ML model are more more likely to happen with certain uh, vocal classes than another. Um, so a lot of the high confidence vocalizations I get for warblers are their songs, and most of the low confidence ones end up being the chip calls. I also, it seems to be a point of a lot of con of confusion where um, a chip call will be identified, for example, in a in a Sierra data set of a red, you know, it'll be identified as a red start and there are like a thousand red start, um, uh, you know, IDs in the data set. And, and that would be exceedingly rare to actually, you know, identify that many red starts in a Sierra forest. So, um, it's almost certainly a chip call of another species, and that is something that um, uh, the makers of machine learning models um, are um, increasingly developing the tools to um, to go not only to species but to class within species. And as we as we train more data um, to distinguish between vocal types, then I think that will get better and better. But right now. 
there there are definitely differences. Awesome. Um, Leo asked, um, he said, you mentioned two sets of data from the ARU that were incorporated. Actually, no, wait, I'm skipping back up. He asked two questions. So I'm going to ask his first question first. Um, no, he asked three. Okay, that's why I'm confused. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so his first question is, you mentioned two sets of data from the ARU that were incorporated into the occupancy model. Can you please uh, repeat which one of them was the one that increased the precision of the model? Yes, it was the score data. Okay. Um, yeah. Let me see if I can get to that slide. Um, to the to the point where it did, you know, when I described our model um, and described creating that ARU visit visit matrix from the thresholded scores, it um, let's see. Not that one. So yeah, this score level data ended up giving the model most of its information from the ARUs rather than this middle like thresholded ARU detection matrix. Um, you can see that here. So including the scores um, does a lot of heavy lifting in this model. Great. Um, so Caitlin asks, can this model be used to integrate citizen science presence only data such as eBird that isn't co-located with the ARUs? Yes, absolutely. And people have, have done that. So that uh, Jeff Dozer, his model that I talked about briefly, um, he wrote a paper in 2021 or at, uh, I don't know if it's that paper, um, but he and his, um, his lab group have worked on integrating eBird data sets with, um, with um, ARU data sets. I think they, they used a validated ARU data set where, um, you know, they actually went in and manually tagged um, IDs in an acoustic data set um, so that they knew that they were free of false positives, but I could be remembering that wrong. Um, yeah, but yes, these models, I mean, the, the beautiful thing about these hierarchical models is that um, they're flexible to data type and um, um, people are working on that. So I would I would check out Jeff Dozer and his work. Great. Um, Leo had another question. Um, he said, in the graph comparing the knockoff experiment results, or where you, I guess where you were knocking things out of the model, uh, it seems that using only ARU data was as good as the full model. Is there any argument for doing point counts? I think that they provide good model validation data, but would they help inform the model beyond what it can do with only the ARU data? This is um, this is a really important question. Um, I would say in the context of this model, uh, it's essential because we don't, because otherwise we have no uh, we have no source of data that's um, that we're assuming is free of false positives uh, to help anchor down those truly occupied sites, because otherwise um, it becomes much harder to estimate the true and false positive rates if you don't have some source of data where you know a positive, where you know a detection means um, that it's a true positive. And so... Um, I think the value of point count data, one of the things we're also investigating is um, it probably depends on the species. For example, you know, common nighthawk are really poorly surveyed by point count data. Obviously, we don't we don't even really include them in, in models that um, that are from point count data only because we know that the the technique isn't designed to to survey for them. Um, but for species uh, where um, that are well surveyed by point count data, I think it allows you to do what we've done and um, and not go in and do intensive model validations um, of your acoustic data uh, and incorporate those into the model. Um, and it yeah, it probably depends on species as well. 
Um, and there was another question from Leo. Uh, you mentioned that you checked the naive occupancy de detections from the ARU data. Did you also test the accuracy of the model predictions by listening to the recordings? We did not listen to the recordings in um, any uh, formalized way. I went in once we got the results from the Blackback data. I just out of curiosity went in and listened to some of the um, the Blackback tags that were, you know, just above the threshold at um, 0.1 versus way above the threshold at eight and found, you know, just out of curiosity, um, found that indeed uh, the false positive rate, even for um, black back detections just above that threshold of zero was still pretty low. Um, but that will definitely vary by species too. So the answer is no. The idea of this model is that we're, we're building it um, with um, the idea that we would scale up to to data sets that have so many sites and so many species that um, it becomes prohibitive to listen to them all. And so we are sort of doing our due diligence now on a small and very well described data set to, to understand um, under what conditions we can uh, we can responsibly use that that unverified machine learning output. Cool. Um, we have a question from Toby. Do you know of any of examples of studies in which people have used multi-year data sets transitioning across years from playback to ARUs? You mentioned multi-year slash dynamic models. Any pubs on this year are aware of? Question mark. Um, keep an eye out for ours. <laughs> I don't know. Um, that's That's what we're working on um right now and i think it was one of the major motivations for um for this work was was building a model that that people could use uh for that very purpose um i am not aware of any existing pubs that do that but if if anyone here does put it in the chat cuz i'd love to read them Let's see. Looks like Leo added a note. Thank you for my questions. Note that you can um, note that you can anchor with true presences by tagging sound recordings manually, right? Question mark? Yes. Yes, definitely. And I would I would refer people to uh, Tessa Reinhardt's model that uses um, only acoustic data, um, but they went in and used a subset of tagged. Um, of uh, of tagged scores um, to help determine those true and false positive rates. And so if you are in the situation where you only have acoustic data at your disposal, um, generating those um, false positive free data sets by verifying is is the way to go. And I would I would recommend reading her paper. Mm -hmm.